Welcome to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. I'm your host, Aaron Heath. I'll take a moment and thank you for downloading, subscribing, and most importantly, listening to episode number 45. Now this episode's show notes can be found at gunrightsintexas.com slash 045. Well, the gun of the show for this episode, being episode number 45, has to be a 45. Now the 45 of choice for this episode happens to be one of my favorite handguns. Reliable to the point it will beat your hand off when the recoil spring breaks, but it will still fire and cycle rounds just like a champ. This gun has reached a level of reliability that even Glocks and M&P pistols strive for. Accurate, consistent, and reliable are the best three words to describe this gun. You're probably wondering what wonder, uh, what wonderful 45 is this, and how much polymer is used in it. Well, the answer to that is it's the Rock Island Armory Compact Tactical and absolutely zero polymer was used in the production of this gun. Now, I'm not feeling too well. I've got a severe headache, so I'm just going to run through the specs that are down and the model of this gun. Well, it's a CS-Tactical. It's chambered in 45 ACP, has a capacity of 6 plus 1, although with the standard magazine, with the standard magazine, however, with the extended magazine that was included with the gun, it has a capacity of 7 plus 1. It is a single-action handgun. It has Novak-style sights. It's made out of steel, and it weighs around 2 pounds and 2 ounces. I know a lot of people will tell me, uh, you know, it's heavy, it's hard to use. And that's true, it's heavy, but it's not hard to use. If you have ever carried a 1911, and you want to carry one concealed, then I would recommend this one. However, that's it for the gun of the show. I know I made it short, sweet, and simple. However, we need to move on because this is a long episode. It's going to actually peak at over an hour. All right, folks, it's time to tell you how to get the show. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast is available on iTunes, on Stitcher, on Myro Player, YouTube, the website, and of course, in your favorite app using the RSS feed on the website. With all those options, there is no excuse for not subscribing. Links to all these can be found on every page of the website. Now, those of you who were listening to me when I explained the gun of the show and why I was going to cut through it, uh, I'm not feeling well. The reason for that is I have a severe headache and my sinuses are running amok. I did some yard mowing and, well, let's just say that my sinuses do not appreciate it in the least. Now, I'm not going to go into listener feedback for this episode because, well, I have something even better for you. I have found a new podcast to consume my time called Come and Take It. And some people are thinking, really, the group Come and Take It has a podcast? Well, not really. This Come and Take It podcast is a history podcast. And let me say that I am enjoying it. I would suggest that listeners take the opportunity to check out Come and Take It, and there'll be a link in the show notes, so, you know, it'll take you right to their episodes page. However, these guys, I have to say, surprise me. Um, you know, a lot of podcasters join it, and they're not really, you know, a lot of podcasters start podcasting, and they're not really all that well-versed in what they're talking about. These guys are. In fact, you can tell when somebody knows quite a bit about Texas history when they can go into an, and do a whole episode on Creed Taylor. And if you do not know who he is, I would suggest doing a lot of research into early Texas history, or you could go listen to Come and Take It. In fact, I'm going to go listen to their Creed Taylor episode. I haven't heard it yet, but I'm going to go listen to it when I finish recording this episode. Now, with that said, once again, I can't stress enough, go to the show notes, follow the link to Come and Take It, and listen to their podcast. If you are at all interested in Texas history, you really need to do it. All right, I'm going to run the little promo that tells you how to get our social media. And after that, we'll go into the actual in, not interview portion. It's a roundtable. That's right. Gun Rights in Texas, roundtable number one, which is like the third roundtable for the show. That's the first one since it's become Gun Rights in Texas. With that said, let's get social. The Gun Rights in Texas podcast has a social media presence. You can like it on Facebook, you can follow it on Twitter, you can circle it on Google+, and you can follow it on Instagram. With all those options, let's get social.
Well, for this episode of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast, we're doing a roundtable, but not with the with any of our previous suspects. We are actually doing this with people that matter a little bit more to the politicians than lobbyists and all that. We're doing this with people that actually are willing to go out there and vote. Um, we actually have a pretty good selection of people. We're doing things a little differently. We got one individual that's on here with me via Google Hangouts and with a video and we've got one individual on with a uh, Skype, not Skype with a phone. And then we've got another individual on, uh, basically in the chat and we'll, uh, hopefully we'll not ignore him too much. <laughs> well, with that said, let me go ahead and, uh, I'll ask Baruti from Texas CHL form to, to introduce himself since he was the first one I got online. So if you would Baruti, please introduce yourself. Hi everybody. My name is Mahmoud Shmaitli. Um, I'm on. I, I've been on the, the forum since 2008, and I got my CHL is also on 08. So it's been like seven years right now. Um, I'm a citizen of United States of America. Very proud to be. Um, uh, I do for a living uh, design verification engineer as a consultant, and uh, so will be a permanent uh, with a, a company. Um, um, if you have any questions about myself, please do ask. Uh, for now, I'll uh, turn the, the microphone uh, to Aaron. And what I'm going to do is, uh, next up, I will have, well, uh, Doug typed in, proud to have you. And Doug is, uh, I might as well get Doug to type up what, how he wants to be introduced while I get Rogue USMC from the Texas CHL Forum to introduce himself. Yes, sir. This is Rogue USMC. I am uh, located in East Texas. I'm actually a Yankee from North Texas, uh, transplanted to East Texas. I am in uh, Western Wear Retail uh, as a profession. I've had my concealed uh, carry permit for uh, about two years now, three years. Uh, very interested in making uh, our gun rights uh better in the, in a manner of speaking, but back where they should be actually when, when you really get down to it. My name is Lee. It's just easier if you, uh, if you want to refer to me as Lee, it's just easier to say. All right. Well, Lee, I'm proud to have you on myself as well as to Baruti. Uh, Doug, how would you like us to introduce you? <laughs> and I want to let him type that while I tell you about myself. Oh, he's got it up. Okay. He's a CHL holder, just having finished his first renewal. He lives in the Clear Lake area, member of the NRA and a PSC. That, for those that don't know, he is a PSC is a shooting range. He lists that he's a pretty heavy libertarian, not the party, uh, or a pretty heavy libertarian bent, not the party. <laughs> That's the problem with me reading. I tend to read and paraphrase, so I may have to go back and uh, type or re-speak what he's typed. Well, with that said, I I am obviously the host of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. My name's Aaron Heath, and I'm proud to have everybody here. And with that said, I am going to switch over to my browser where I have our list of topics. And, well, before I go into that, because there is an elephant in the room, how about we all kind of give our position, and I'll let Baruti start it, but what's everybody's position on... The situation with Corey Watkins and his little rant, I guess you could call it, or threat. Anybody uh, hasn't seen that, I'm sorry for bringing it up, but apparently he actually made terroristic threats to our legislatures or legislators. Actually, I'll state my position. Um, I was, for, of course, uh, for the CHL program and concealed uh, carry. Um, now, as I know, like uh, people are divided between open on the open carry issue, whether it uh, should be licensed under CHL, I call it CHL option to open carry, or uh, constitutional carry like Vermont, Alaska, and other states. Uh, but each state is different. I, I don't believe at this time we can get to uh, unlicensed open carry. Um, now, it does not help at all. Uh, uh, things like that happened recently. Uh, by going into the legislature uh, office and try to unblock the door and uh, threatening the legislature in his office, then later on on Twitter uh, or on uh, social media by writing uh, uh, 
uh, accusing uh, legislators who are not in favor of open carry uh, without a license and call them uh, as a traitors um, and threatening them uh, with the, the, with the uh, punishable by death or whatever is the, he's referring to as the, the punishment for the traitors. Then he uh, retracted uh, what he said and issued a statement that he's a nonviolent guy, he never intended to threaten anybody and stuff. But whatever he was doing, this person never helped or will never help his cause. I would say it's somebody is like, you know, jumping uh, over the bridge rather than uh, crossing the bridge. Um, so uh, what he did is, is totally unacceptable and does not reflect uh, the decency and the honor of those people who carry daily uh, to protect uh, themselves and others um, around them. Um, uh, really, really, I'm upset to see this happening. I was shocked, really, when I read about it. Um, uh, the other person uh, um, from Open, from OCT, uh, who started the whole thing about OCT, actually, is less uh, radical, and sometimes you can reason with him. Uh, and he was accepting, in the first place, a licensed open carry, because, he, because I've heard him saying, uh, we will take a licensed open carry if we cannot uh, get... Uh, 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 the constitution carry or unlicensed or open carry. Uh, so this is my position. I prefer to go with the, uh, even for certain time, to have open carry with the license, um, then, which license would be CHL, I believe. Um, then we'll see how it goes from there. And uh, people in the future will, uh, um, will understand that uh, we are not just the freaks, we are not monsters. Because we've been doing that for 20 years right now, since 95 to 2015. This is 20, uh, 20, uh, 20 years where our community, uh, armed citizens of the United States in Texas, have proven that we are one of the safest community around that, do, that are armed in the society. Well, I appreciate that. Uh, I want to go ahead and let Lee give us his statement, and I'll read uh, Doug's statement. So, Lee, if you would, let us know where you're at. Well, uh, I just, uh, I mean, it's just unsociable the way, <laughs> you know, you catch more bees with honey than you do with vinegar. And mm -hmm. uh, the the fact that he's just, it's just counterproductive. And I don't know whether he just does not understand this or he does and, you know, doesn't care or, you know, what his motivation for this is other than maybe being just self-serving uh, and, Truth be told, he's actually being self-defeating in everything he's doing if his stated goal is actually the goal that he's a, he's wanting to achieve. He's just being self-defeating in that. Uh, it's making it a lot harder for those that are working the proper channels. They're going to have to expend more effort. Uh, it's just kind of, you know, making everyone else take a step back and they have to regain that step. So it's just unsociable, uh, rude, uh, you know, why are you going to come into someone's workplace and harass them like that to begin with? And then being armed on top of that, it's just, it's just not a good thing to do. And it's just making it harder for everyone else. Well, uh, Doug typed in that if he said what he really thought of Corey, he'd get banned from the internet. In his opinion, Corey is auditioning <laughs> for a starring role in the next sequel of Jackass. Well, he may be. All he has done is provide political cover for those who are on the fence for open carry. And to be honest, I feel that he's right. In my opinion, I, I would agree with that. In my opinion, Corey Watkins is he's not he's not a libertarian, he's not a conservative, he's not a liberal, he's an anarchist. And to be and to be entirely uh, truthful in this matter, I am not a mental health professional. However, if I were, I'm certain I would probably find Corey Watkins to be mentally incapable. I would say mentally unstable. Yes. <laughs> now, in the video, I noticed that he was actually kind of a... Uh, he looked like he was stoned in the video, so I'm wondering if he really... if he really was in his right mind when he did that, or if that... or whatever was... Whatever substance he was on, because nobody looks like that normally. So if he was on a substance, whatever substance he was on, did that cause him to reveal his true position? Or was that kind of like people refer to alcohol as being liquid courage? 
I would agree with that assessment. I mean, this is just another uh, example of him just stepping out there in a very odd way. I mean, going into the legislator's office is armed to begin with. I mean, being armed is in and of itself is a non-issue, but the, you know, attitude in which he carried himself and walked in there. And then now these bold statements, these inappropriate <laughs> statements, I mean, it's completely not acceptable to civil society. In all honesty, I don't think he was armed when he went into the legislator's offices because from what I understand, he's got a, he's not got a conviction on it yet, but he's been charged with a class B misdemeanor. So he's not eligible for a concealed handgun license. And the only way you can go into the Capitol building armed is with a concealed handgun license. So I don't think he was armed when he went in there. Uh, Doug also commented on the, on the, on the shut window. Okay. He's got a, so how can we affect inserting substantial distance between us, the responsible gun owners and the he haws like Corey? Well, I think actually they've kind of done that for us themselves when they started attacking the NRA and the TSRA. I mean, right now you're seeing, when you see news articles about it, you see them referring to Watkins as a member of open carry Texas or as the leader of open carry Tarrant County. So. In a lot of these cases, there are the media is already separating him from us, you know, as a result of their earlier actions. The little uh, scuffle between the NRA and the open carry advocates, I'm going to use that term loosely in this instance, that little scuffle between them where the NRA uh, made the statement and then retracted it, that may have actually helped kind of color the media as, hey, they're not getting along over there, so they're a different group. As far as being, uh, as far as we distancing ourselves from them, I think when we call the legislative or the, our legislators and start talking about, hey, I want to support this bill or that bill, if they ask us, hey, are you involved in this open carry deal? Explain to them, I've, I'm a licensed concealed handgun holder or licensed concealed, I have a concealed handgun license. I have held it for X number of years and I do not approve of the actions that they have done here, you know, basically be truthful. You know, your CHL works as a good guy card, and I think we need to capitalize on that. Um, uh, true, actually. I mean, uh, our role it did not end uh, yet with the, with, the, with the elections, and we have a lot to push uh, for the bills to pass at the time when we can, uh, we'll be called actually to to call our um, re representatives and uh, senators so we can push for the bill that has a chance to pass. Um, now, what I would like to mention, actually, uh, we had open carry, actually, in Texas on the books, part of the exemptions um, uh, that we had before. Uh, one can, for example, can carry while hunting, open carry while hunting, um, or while going to a range, or coming from a range, going to his home, from his car to his uh, to his to his house for example all of that is, is possible mm -hmm. um but everybody never use that because those are exceptions and all the time they're gonna think this because it's exception if i do it they might be stopped um detained maybe arrested and i have to prove that i was doing a b and c because it's up, up to the uh, discretion of the police officers to decide whether it's, yeah, you, you looks like you are going to the range or it's just like a two minutes walk or it's like 20 miles away. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, uh, this is a so open carry actually uh, even was um, um, practice in Texas, even though very rarely or in an unlimited fashion. Um, now, things that people really was, I was really, really concerned about is having um, this uh, disorderly conduct while, while you are carrying a firearm, whether it's a long firearm, which is the only way you are, were, were able to be having uh, open carry for long firearms, uh, and people, uh, the police may detain you because you did disorderly conduct or whatever is the case. Um, so... This has to be addressed whenever we go to open carry, actually. Uh, in addition, um, um, I can add that we have more bills, more important bills for us than just open carry. As a CHLers, we have the bill, the 308 bill, which is uh, re uh, repeal the restrictions where we can be or where we cannot go 
um, which are off limits for us. And uh, this is a very, very important for many, many people. Um, I, I give an example that had uh, happened to me last week, actually. I was uh, I had uh, my my daughter. She's a she's a, pre a, a competitor in uh, archery, and she has a tournament. The tournament was in a range, so I carried into the range. But of a sudden, I said, "Hey, Mahmoud, uh, you are carrying. This is her se sections by the high school. High school by the by um, Allen ISD." And I I decided, no, I have to remove my firearm, and put it back in the car, because this is a section or a, a event even though I was in a range. Mm -hmm. So many things are really, really, uh, when, when we are talking about off limits, it does get us into confusion or oh, I forget about that. Let me think what I'm doing here and so on. Uh, so if we repeal uh, the off limits, it's of great importance to us than just open carry. I agree. And speaking of the right. off limits locations, Bill, I mean, uh, you've already told us where you're at on it. So let me... Let me go ahead and ask Lee what's his position on it while we get Doug to type his up so we can read that. Sure. The, uh, that is probably next to, well, I, it, they go hand in hand, that and the campus carry, but the restriction, removing restrictions on where you can carry, especially at, at, at least to the point to where uh, a citizen can carry in the same places that another citizen that happens to have a badge on can carry. That's, you know, there's, there should be no class differentiation. So, you know, making a, you know, drawing a line saying these people can do it and these people cannot, it just, it creates a class sort of barrier that is completely, uh, I don't know, I, you know, the word unconstitutional is overused, but it is definitely unconstitutional. But uh, it is just completely inappropriate. Good for me, you know, good for the goose, good for the gander kind of thing. They have uh, federal legislation doing with uh, body armor is the same type of thing. They, there's language in it saying that if you're a government employee, it's okay. You can have body armor. I mean, why are you differentiating one civilian from another civilian? But uh, definitely the top of the list, uh, and they're, they're near tied, is the cam the campus carry and the reducing the restricted lo restricted locations for licensed carriers. Those kind of run hand in hand and are kind of tied in as far as uh, importance in my mind, because the having to disarm uh, in a public place is never really a desirable thing to happen, and we've seen where uh, active shooter events happen where on campuses more than any other single type of location. So, you know, why are you going to restrict uh, defensive options on the place that statistically has more of those problems? So it's, you know, the, the campus carrying works hand in hand with the reducing of the off limits locations. Those would, are the time for the top two in my mind. No, I agree there. The uh, campus carry, Bill, I want to have a separate discussion on it in just a moment, so we'll come back to that next. However, the off-limits locations for me is extremely critical, and we've got Doug's up here now, so I'll go ahead and read it. And he's got... I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It's for my wife. Ah, he's got it up here that it... it hit. This is what he's typed, and I'm just going to read it as a quote. It almost seems like... One needs a law book with them to know where you can and cannot carry. Law should be simple and make common sense. It should feel natural. Current regulations require a bit of study. Even then, people can read the regulations and come to different conclusions. To me, that's not common sense. We should be able to carry anywhere any government person can. And I will agree with that with a caveat. I agree that we should be able to carry anywhere a law enforcement officer or other government employee can except in secure locations such as the secure location of an airport. Obviously, uh, that is more of a political consideration there rather than uh, CHLs are unsafe. And I, locations that are sensitive like, say, a jail system where the officers aren't, you know, you got certain officers that may carry in there, but these are ones that are actually going in and they're going in because there's a problem and they may need that weapon. So I don't think the average person should be able to carry in those situations, in those locations. 
But, this is this doesn't make make sense, right? But uh, beyond that, you know, yeah. beyond that, no, you know, anywhere anywhere my buddy that's a sheriff's deputy can carry, I should be able to carry. You know, right now I cannot go sign the key out to use the county law enforcement range because that's the range everybody uses here at the county in Gaines County. I cannot go in armed to sign out the key to the law enforcement range because the county jail is there and it's considered a correctional facility. You know, it's kind of like the whole, you know, portion or portion of a building that applies to courthouses. Yeah. And, you know, that's going to be corrected soon because our county is building a separate jail and what's now the current jail is going to become office spaces. So that's going to change my situation there. However, I should be able to walk into the lobby of that uh, law enforcement center, which has a jail on the other side of a very secure room. You know, and that jail's a very secure jail. It's been updated to meet current standards. So basically, I should be able to carry in there while somebody comes out and brings me a key so I can go to the range and shoot. I should not have to disarm and leave my weapon in my vehicle at a law enforcement location. I agree. How about courts? Because courts as well, I believe, a judge will never allow uh, a CHR to carry in his court, even the law may say, or may not say that you can carry in in a court. Um, Prosecutors, they may carry there because they know the judge and they know what they do, or the... um, or the court uh, uh, protections uh, people, which is uh, the the officers of the court. Um, I think this is what we also maybe still off, off limits for us. Even though I wish it's not, because we are not doing something wrong by by carrying concealed. And uh, Doug typed up in TDCJ, that's Texas Department of Criminal Justice units. The officers don't carry anything more than some high potency mace and. For most cases at the sheriff's office, that's the case uh, here with our local jail. But I do know one time they had a they had a fight where somebody had a weapon, and this may be one of the neighboring counties that had the problem. And uh, I know some of the some of the sheriff's deputies had to go in there armed because they didn't want to have that weapon turned on them. And I I want to believe it was a uh, you know just a typical uh, shiv or shank type you know homemade weapon. I don't remember what it was. I was in high school at that time, and we heard about it. And one of the one of the students that was in high school with me, he was actually in that jail facility himself. Uh, he got picked up for an MIP, and that's how how it got how everybody in town got uh, made aware of it. And that same that same uh, individual is now in law enforcement himself. So basically, I agree completely that you know. Except in certain secure areas, uh, no animal better than any other animal. You know, no person better than any other person. But then you just fall back into the same rub as how is a secured area defined. And if someone wants the whole building, you know, off limits because that's their preference, they just deem it secure, you know, that you get back into the... I mean, I I, I totally agree. In, in detention facilities... You know, if the if the guards have a restriction on being armed, I don't have a problem with my restriction being armed. Mm-hmm. You know, but but if you if you were to drop back and say, okay, it's you know the facilities are off limits except for the secure portion, but then it's up to so and so Joe Schmo's you know discretion that's in charge of that facility as to what part of it is secure. So you know you, you'd have to have all that spelled out, and then once you start trying to spell out that, you're not going to be able to cover every conceivable, you know, location, every conceivable arrangement, so to speak. So you're you're kind of open up your own can of worms. I agree so, there. You know, it, it's it's careful, and whenever you put restrictions, they have to be dialed in right. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, they're a lot of times self defeating. You know, and that's one reason I keep, you know, saying we need to keep going back to the well. You know, we get something, you know, it's not something we're going to be able to fix overnight. We make a repair, we move forward, and we encounter this, you know, issue. Well, we come back, we fix it the next time. Maybe not the next time, maybe the time after that. You know, we keep trying until we get it done. And that's one thing we are uh, having to deal with. Now, Doug also typed in that... uh he doesn't fully agree with the airport areas, but he'll leave that thought for another day. And, uh, you know, 
in my case, the airport area is more of a political consideration than it is a uh, you know practical consideration. Simply because Agreed. it it'd be too difficult to fight that through the legislature, or the uh, federal legislature, and the state legislature as well. Because right now, I don't see the votes being there for it. But let's move no. on and touch on campus carry once again. We'll let uh, and uh, we'll go ahead. We'll let uh, Baruti handle that or start that after I read Doug's next comment. He commented that agree airports are a bridge too far right now. So, yeah. Rudy, if you would uh, give us your position on campus carry. Yeah. Now, uh, before jumping on, on to uh, pink, uh, the campus carry, just let me uh, say a word about what are secure areas. Um, if you can Agreed. see that uh, secure areas, by definition, everybody will pat it down if they have firearms, there is magnetic sensors, or there is um, um, full body scanners. Uh, like the airports, when you go to the secure area, you're gonna be you're basically searched uh, almost naked uh, in front in front of a monitor. Uh, of course, actually, they have also uh, the path through doors to detect uh, magnetic uh, 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 magnetically detect uh, if you have firearms on you or not. Uh, so, and in jails, actually, they they have to provide you a, a safe storage for your firearms before you being disarmed. Um, so most likely, this is what defines actually a secure area where you are disarmed or you've been searched for firearms, and as such, you'll be like everybody else unarmed. Uh, so, and this is why they, they try to define it as a secure area. Now, as per campus carry, okay, um, I, I, uh, I lived in academia for eight years um, while doing PhD at my university and a master's degree. So I know actually how does it feel the contention that happens between students and teachers or students and students. But we are adults at that age. I mean, we are not in a high school. Uh, we are tw almost 20, 21 years old uh, by the time before we graduate, actually. And nobody can carry until he's uh, 21 years of age, at least. So by that age, one has to be having very responsible and uh, if you, if you are in a in a in a college at 21 years old, you you you're mostly likely you being you graduated from your undergrad and you are doing graduate school, um, or you are in the last year doing so. You are a basically senior uh, uh, student. Um, so uh, the issue is that everybody the antis try to bring up uh, like uh, those people are under stress. They have. Um, um, issues with their uh, professors, uh, they have issues with their buddies, there is peer-to-peer uh, -peer pressure, all that it does not fly when you are talking about uh, undergrad or graduate school. Um, so I am for campus carry because if we're going to keep it uh, 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 at, at gun-free zones, you're going to see people going into a library and start shooting everybody. And nobody can defend them, nobody can Basically, in a, in, a, in a library, you get stuck because the exits are limited, and you will be like a sitting duck waiting to be shot and killed. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of innocent people. They don't know how to defend themselves, especially like ladies, uh, young, young uh, ladies, actually. Um, they will, will hide behind a table or something, and they're going to be shot no matter what. Um, so um, at least they will have a chance, one, to defend himself and others, if there is a concealed carry on campus. And since it's still concealed, uh, nobody will see it, nobody will freak out, and everybody will do whatever they've been doing and without uh, feeling uh, um, at, uh, at ease, basically, without uh, feeling, uh, uh, the feeling the tension or anything like that. People say, oh, I need to study, I don't want to see a gun. Okay, we are not talking about open can carry in, on a campus, we are talking about CHL. So um, to summarize, I'm for opening, uh, uh, for a CHL on campuses. Well, I appreciate that. And we'll come back to Doug's comment after we let Lee uh, give us his position. And we'll let, uh, while that's going on, we'll let Doug type up anything else he wants to add to this. So Lee, if you would, let us know where you stand on campus, carry. Well, uh, as spoke before, you know, the really, uh, repealing of a lot of the off-limits areas is kind of, uh, you know, tied in with campus carry. You can't really ignore campuses. As an example, just uh, Monday night, I took a group of our youth from the church to uh, UT Tyler for a uh, event at their uh, activities center. And 
of course, as a CHO, I can. I had to disarm it in the parking lot. I'm perfectly legal to carry it out there, but I had to leave it out in the church van before I walked in. And I mean, it, we're talking 50 yards from the doors where I parked. So that's where you know, once once I was in there, I was disarmed. Uh, you know, and I'm not going to college now. I do have a daughter that's in college, and she. Uh, I would like for her to be able to at least be covered by MPA on campus. Uh, so, you know, campus carry would be tied not only to licensed carry, but to uh, MPA also. Uh, I have a slight, you know, disagreement with Beirutti as far as uh, ages. Uh, personal responsibility used to happen a lot younger. Uh, take, uh, I believe it was uh, George Washington was surveying for his county at the age of 14. Now, you know, you're expected, you know, if you're a teenager, you're expected to act like a teenager. Nobody expects anything more from you. So it's just the way society has changed. But I don't have necessarily a problem right now with the licensing requirements and having it pertain to uh, campus carry. If I had my druthers, you would go to, you know, if you have a gun, take it in any way you want to carry it. But, you know... Baby steps. All of this, you know, campus carry, removing of uh, restrictions, uh, license open carry. They're all baby steps. As long as those baby steps are in the right direction, I'm content. So, you know, it's, campus carry is right up there with removing all the other uh, unnecessary restrictions on our carry. Well, I appreciate that because that's almost exactly what I'm thinking on the issue. But before I share my thoughts on the issue, let me uh, go ahead and read what. Uh, Doug has typed up, he typed up, look at what happened, or sorry, I started below where he started. Campus carry prohibitions, blah, my tongue's tied. Campus carry prohibitions do nothing more than create artificial soft targets. Look at what happened at Virginia Tech. Had anyone been holding a concealed weapon, it would have ended much sooner. Notice the SWAT team waited outside the building and didn't enter until the shooting stopped. Those people should have had the right to defend themselves, but were deprived of it by an act of government. The little L libertarian in me says that one person or group of people does not have the right to deny another the ability to defend themselves. And I do agree in that regard as well. My position on campus carry is I've got a nephew and I want to also say a niece that's not a niece that will be attending college. Uh, not We got two sessions before they go to college. And so basically we got this session and two more and then they'll be in college. And I want... I want to make sure that if they're in there and somebody decides to go in and start shooting in their college, that at least somebody there has a chance to have a gun. You know, it's to me, you know, if that, if the TA that's teaching the class is able to draw and defend himself and stop the attacker, everybody that would be attacked after that attacker is stopped, they were saved by the uh, CHL that defended himself. And if my nephew and well, she's not my niece, uh, she might as well be. I mean, I've known her all of her life, and uh, I've treated her like a niece. And, you know, if my nie nephew and niece are, you know, in college and there's a shooting at their college and somebody stops the shooter, I'll be in eternally grateful to them for it. Simply because, to me, to me, it's not about having myself or somebody, I am, my, one of my loved ones have the ability to defend themselves. It's about everybody having the ability to defend themselves. Because those that don't have the ability might actually be protected by those who do. And, you know, it's just like if I'm sitting in a restaurant and somebody comes in and starts shooting, if I have no option, I will do what I can to stop it. And I'm certain everybody else here would do the same. I'm not saying I would, in a, I would uh, move towards the sound of the gunfire and not try to escape first, because that's more of a personal decision between everybody else. But if I had no option, yeah, I'd stop it. And, you know, actually, in the college, yeah. it's the same thing. Yeah. Actually, um, it's not just uh, for, uh, uh, like, in, from a point of view of libertarian that nobody has the right to stop you from defending yourself. Mm -hmm. It's actually, actually, it's um, immoral. And they never, accept, those who are going to deny you the right to defend yourself, they will never, ever take the responsibility if somebody killed you. We're going to say, oh, I did not kill you. Somebody else killed you, yeah. but they denied you the right to defend yourself, which I call them a, an accessory to the murder, right? 
because if you are disabled, if you are being the, the, disarmed from defending yourself, and nobody is trying to protect you whatsoever, so they are negligently uh, being accessory to the murder. Um, and we can see that actually uh, in France, right? Uh, yep. Terrorists went and killed everybody, and um, even when the police showed up, they start running backwards rather than uh, taking on the on the on the on the bad guys. So, and actually, as he mentioned earlier, um, in Virginia, the SWAT stayed outside to know exactly what's happening before entering the school. And those are the special people, okay, mm. well trained to address a fire by fire. You know, you know, but um, they did not. So. If somebody is not willing to defend you, why I have to wait for somebody to defend me? I have to I have the right to defend myself. And, you know, just a point uh, that needs to be brought up. The Supreme Court has said that law enforcement has no duty to protect you. Exactly. So when somebody, when something like that happens and there's a shooter, even if law enforcement is there, it's up to you to defend yourself. Right. It's not just your right, it's your responsibility. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it all comes back to responsibility that I mentioned earlier is, you know, once upon a time, you know, I mentioned George Washington. I think he was a surveyor for official surveyor for his county at the age of 14. He started things a lot younger. You were having to take responsibility for your own life younger. Mm -hmm. And, you know, as far as even the licensing requirements, it wouldn't bother me a bit if they backed it up to 18. If you're old enough to vote, if you're old enough to you know, by controlled substances, you should be able to old enough to, you know, carry a gun. So, you know, it's, it, we need to go back to personal responsibility, and that's what we just landed on there is it's nobody's responsibility but your own to defend you. And while I was talking, uh, Doug typed up, agree, if you disarm me, you should be forced to accept the liability for having done so. I'm not sure the general population gets that point that the Leos have no responsibility to protect or defend we the people. And I believe he was actually typing that towards uh, as a response to Baruti, but I'm not entirely sure. Uh, let me go on to say, though, that we got one more topic I want to touch on before we close this up, and that particular topic is one that uh, we discussed in a roundtable I had. I, I want to say it was discussed in that roundtable, but uh, that was an earlier roundtable before I rebranded the podcast, and... That would be actually adding a few, adding some teeth to our preemption law. Essentially, uh, what this is is there's a couple of bills that would. Uh, I'm trying to think of the best way to put it. I don't have an outline in front of me, which makes it harder for me to do this. Essentially, the you have penalties for government agencies or government bodies that would post unenforceable 30.6 signs, and. You know, the Texas Firearms Coalition, which is Charles Cotton's organization, you know, they they support this particular bill, but they want and he wants an amendment, and I agree with it, that would allow for private causes of action. So with that said, what's everybody's position on actually uh, having penalties for government uh, or political subdivisions of the state of Texas and government agencies that post unenforceable 30-06 signs? What's the, everybody's opinion on penalties for them? Um, let me start. Actually, I think this the penalty actually will be paid by the the taxpayers, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think this should be. Uh, it could have be, could be helpful, but shouldn't be uh, necessary. I mean, uh, directives from the government agency should be enough to remove all non compliant thirty and six or unenforceable. Um, like if you are talking about the attorney general, the attorney general can say uh, you cannot put this on any on on, on those places. Like even uh, the city of Allen, um, they had in the police department an old notice that says uh, firearms are not allowed if you found if we, you've been found with the firearm in the lobby. Basically, uh, you're gonna be arrested. Uh, this is an old sign, um, but they never posted 30 at six there. But it was removed later on because what people start complaining, why well, well, you cannot do this? Uh, and um, you have, we have to understand that people could have been uh, saying, oh, let me carry my AK or long rifle and go, go to the police department. Uh, 
uh, which is uh, totally unwise to do, right? Even it could be illegal. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and maybe this is the, they have to address those people as well. Uh, the CHRs will never really look at those because he knows this is unforceable. Uh, now, as, as for fines, it could be helpful because many, many places I found they were posting signs which are unenforceable. Um, I had also a concern too, um, and which sometimes it was helpful, like, you know, uh, uh, Grapevine Mills, um, they had unenforceable signs, but the Grapevine Police Department says anybody who entered the, the mall uh, while concealed carrying, we, we would be arrested, even the signs are un unenforceable. So uh, this is on private property, not government property. Mm -hmm. So the government can be asked uh, to remove any non-enforceable uh, sign, and they should comply. Okay, uh, private properties they can put whatever they want, whether it's enforceable or non-enforceable. But also, we cannot trust the police. Say you're going to be arrested even the sign wasn't unenforceable. We may you have know? to check with Charles Cotton. Excuse me. <clears throat> Uh -huh. But we may have to check with Charles Cotton and see if uh, there's a provision in there for the scenario you're mentioning. And yeah. uh, basically, I think if uh, if law enforcement attempts to enforce an unenforceable sign, and there was mm -hmm. a case in Level in Texas, uh, mm -hmm. I want to say November or so, might have been October, October November. I want to say there's a case in Level End, and uh, it was posted to the forum by I believe it's a CHL instructor. I'll have to go back to my notes. Um, but the, very similar to what you were describing. So there may be a situation there that we may need to look at a little closer and see if, uh, see if these bills address that. And that's a very good point. Let me go ahead and read what Doug's typed and then we'll turn it over to Lee. Uh, let's see. Yes. If we, the people break a law, we have to pay a penalty. Government should be in the same boat. I also believe we should be able to hold those who directed such postings to be personally responsible. If the taxpayers pay the bill, the city administrators or city council won't care. If this hits them in the wallet, they'll pay attention. And I agree with Doug on that. Uh, I believe Florida has a similar provision in their, uh, in their law that gave teeth to their preemption law. Now let's go ahead and turn it over to Lee, see what his position on it is. Well, I'm pretty much in agreement with everything that's been said. The, right now, about the best we can hope for is if a uh, say because people have brought up that well, it's just department policy that they do it per department policy, and that takes the responsibility off of the the uh, police officer, which I really entirely don't have a problem with the officer's action if it's at direction from above, you know, if it, if it's going to cost their job. Mm -hmm. But uh, the, if you do have there's some communities here in Texas that have been known to be somewhat anti-gun and the best we can hope for if they start doing any of this is a possible cease and desist letter from the attorney general if the attorney general decides to you know take the time to do that and is he going to take the time to do that for, in each case you know i mean that's just occupying time that's better spent elsewhere uh so we're kind of at a impasse because we can't, we we're held responsible for the letter of the law, but those that are charged with enforcing the law are not held to the same standard. So that's where the challenge comes in. I mean, if you're if you're charged with enforcing the law, you should know the law first off. But then, if you are found in violation, you should have a more of a responsibility than you know, or a penalty than we do because you're charged with enforcing that. So you know, it, it comes it comes back, and, and I like the uh, reference there about holding the city council people or those that make the decision to post that invalid posting or unenforceable posting uh, personally responsible. It comes back to personal responsibility. You can't hide behind a position or behind a uh, organization. You're, you're bringing it back out and laying it at their feet because they're the ones that made that decision. If I'm at work and I make a decision, they're not, they're not going to go through and excuse my decision that hurt the company they're going to hold me responsible for it. So, you know, if, if like they really said, it's, I, I can definitely identify with that is that if you, that you were to be assessed uh, damages, so to speak, it's the taxpayer funds that are going to be covering those damages, not people's personal funds. And the city council really 
that's not a big concern with them because they're already spending money. And it's not their personal money per se. Mm -hmm. So putting people personally responsible will go a long way. Well, uh, Doug typed up a little more. I almost called him Dave, and I apologize for that. Uh, He typed up. I also, well, let's see here. I was going to start back. I also believe we should be able to hold those who directed the postings to be personally responsible. If the taxpayers pay the bill, the city administrators or council won't care. If it hits them in the wallet, they'll pay attention. So that's where he, uh, that's what he typed earlier. And now he added to that sauce for the goose should be sauce for the gander. Meaning uh, for those who don't recognize that old saying, it basically means that uh, what's good for one is good for the other. And, you know, I, I suspect everybody in this uh, round table gets that, but you know, some of the listeners may not. I mean, some, some of the listeners, I think maybe, uh, maybe, uh, Bloomberg employees, <laughs> because there's a few, uh, there's a few downloads that actually go through New York city. Cause I can actually see the markets where the downloads are. And, uh, there's a few downloads in New York city and I believe Bloomberg's outfits are all headquartered there. So anyways, uh, so basically on these issues, I believe we're all in agreement. We need to make progress on them. Although off limits locations and campus carry are really the two priorities for us. The, uh, unenforceable postings we need to get a little more information on and if it's okay with you guys what i'll do is when i get the audio file uh when i get the interview portion that we're doing right now when i get that processed i'll send each of you a voice mess or a private message on the forum with a link to where y'all can download and listen to it plus i'll also send a link to it to charles cotton so he can listen to it and maybe he can address anything that uh we brought up that you know he may you know, he may already say, hey, yeah, this is taken care of here or something like that. Excuse me. One thing I'd like to point out, though, uh, one of us, I want to say it was uh, Lee or it was Baruti. One of us had a uh, comment made that, oh, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> uh, oh, the uh, uh, the disorderly conduct with, uh, with regards to yeah, open care. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I do know that uh, TSRA planned a bill for that. I don't know if there's actually any plan, or I don't know what the situation on it is, but I've, I know Charles has referred to it since the, uh, since the roundtable. And I believe it was episode 10 of this podcast. I had a roundtable with Charles Cotton, Alice Tripp, and C.J. Grisham. And uh, I believe we mentioned the disorderly conduct statute needing to be revised there. I know Charles has said as much, so... If there's not a bill filed on it right now, I I think we'll probably see one. What were CJ's comments on that? I think he was actually in support of it too, um, hmm. especially when you consider that's what he was initially arrested for. Right. Actually, uh, unbelievable. Now he uh, he was uh, arrested for disorderly conduct, which is carrying in a uh, firearm manner or threatening manner or whatever is the case. All calculated to her. Then he was convicted with another charge, mm-hmm. but he wasn't arrested for the for the other charge. Yep. I mean, I, how one can be convicted for something he wasn't arrested for? You know, that's, uh, that's a very interesting thing, and uh, you know, I think that's part of, I think that's part of the reason a lot of people, you know, jumped in and supported him after his conviction was simply because of that. Now, yeah. let me say this. I think how he was, I think that whole conviction thing and his uh, charges and his prosecution, I think that was all messed up. However, for full disclosure, let me say that uh, me and CJ Grisham really don't like each other. And that's putting it mildly. Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, I mean okay. Um, uh, yeah, we'll discuss it later on. <laughs> yeah. I have, personal, I have personal dealing with the CJ and OCT. Mm hmm. Um, which is basically only is limited to being on the Facebook of his Facebook page. <laughs> I've had a and, few uh, conversations with him, so I uh-huh. think I know where you're coming from. Yeah. Uh, well, when, when that video first surfaced, one, the police officers were out of line, but it was what brought that all on was all CJ. So, you know, you can't really bl- set the blame any one particular place. And I think once, once they actually got him, you know, in the process, they were going to nail him down somewhere or another. So, you know, that 
CJ's actions started the whole thing. So he can't place the blame anywhere really else. Now, where, does that mean that everybody else was just in what they did? No. <laughs> so. Well, let me uh, go ahead and read what Doug typed up. He typed up, I'm no fan of CJ, but I really don't think anyone should become a criminal for keeping and bearing arms. He may be a jerk, but he has the same human rights we should all have. And uh, Doug kind of got knocked off, and I think he's back on now. Because uh, we've now got two Dugs. One is blue, and one is blacked out. <laughs> so I think we got two Dugs now. Well, uh, gentlemen, I want to let you all have a chance to do some closing statements, but... I do I do want to get back to something I started when I had Charles, CJ, and Alice on here. I want to ask each of you when I turn it over to you to tell me what the last gun you fired was. So we'll go to Baruti. Baruti, if you got any closing statements, uh, let us hear them, and be sure to let us know what the last gun you shot was. Actually, I'm very uh, excited to be part of this uh, uh, forum, uh, Texas CHL Forum, and being also on this uh, uh, video conference uh, discussing uh, open carry and other uh, gun bills to coming for the session 2015. Uh, closing by saying we need to be more productive, uh, more encouraged, and not be pessimistic a lot. Um, we have a lot of uh, drive already uh, that we can ask our uh, what we can have in our rights, basically being restored. And even step by step, is still in the right direction. Uh, ju- uh, jumping to like um, from uh, license to uh, constitutional, at this time will 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 be maybe uh, maybe not having a acceptance in the society, at least in Texas, uh, uh, with the community. Uh, so I would say, even when we push further, they will have a less chance, and to have any. A sense of uh, fear, okay, or any reason to object by having our gun rights, okay. All the time they will bring in the safety issue, be, be, uh, the fear issue, but at the end of the day, uh, nothing will. Uh, the world will stay the same. Tomorrow the sun will rise. You know, everybody is still happy, and we are finding out even when the the, the guns sales are going through the roof. Uh, c- crime is going down. So, and um, this is something they, they, the anti-guns have a hard time justifying what's happening. Um, and I would like to thank you, Aaron, for the uh, for hosting this session. And I'll give the microphone back to you. All right. Well, uh, I want to get Doug to type up any final statement he has. And then uh, while he's doing that, I'm going to let Lee make his final statement. Lee, uh, anything you got to say, let us know. And before I turn it over to you, let me ask uh, Baruti if he would mind telling us what the last gun he shot was. Oh, that's, oh I'm sorry. The last uh, uh, firearm I shot is a Steyr Malicher SSG-04 in 300 Winchester Magnum. This is my long-range target uh, rifle. I was shooting at 500 yards. That's impressive. <laughs> and I uh, appreciate you being on the podcast. Uh Lee, if you would, let us know what your last statement or what your final statement is and what the last firearm you shot was. Well, just as a closing statement, I want to say that uh, this podcast is going a long way in the right direction as far as presenting a friendly face to the gun culture. And uh, that's what we need to continue to do is put a, a friendly face for there's some people that just have an inherent fear of firearms. And the more friendly we can put the face on, the better, I guess you could say, the pill is to swallow. So uh, thank you for having us on. I enjoyed it. Uh, last firearm I shot was actually a Ruger Mark III little target pistol. I wish I could say that it was a you know big old target uh <laughs> You know, gun like like the Rudy did. That sounds like an awesome rifle. I haven't shot long distance since I was in the service years ago. But uh, if anybody wants a good little, just a fun gun to shoot, Ruger Mark Three, twenty two long rifle, excellent little pistol. I've I've actually got uh, two of those in the twenty two forty five variant, and they're they are nice guns. And uh, Doug, I see you've got your statement up. Uh, Doug says he agrees with Baruti in that we need a coordinated effort to move forward, but it is sad that we have to fight so hard to recover rights that we have by nature and were defined in the Constitution. 
We need to get all the gun rights groups together to work towards the same goal. The Second Amendment community has a bad habit of forming a circular firing squad. And he types in that the last gun he fired, or the last guns he fired were 1911s. Is there anything else? Over 100 years and still going. And I have to, I have to agree. Uh, the gun, the last gun I fired is a uh, Sig 938. It's a, it's, Designed off the 1911 pattern, I love that little pistol. It's, uh, in my opinion, it's probably one of the better guns on the market in the pocket gun category. And I was out shooting, and we had a young lady shooting a 9 millimeter, and she was complaining about the recoil on it. And I had my 45 in my inside the waistband, and I had the Sig as a backup gun, so I let her shoot it. And I think I think Sig Sauer may have a uh, new customer out of her. Just uh, uh, based off her reaction. And Bonus. The last thing I'd like to say I, before I, we close this out, I appreciate you guys being here, and I really appreciate your uh, sitting down, spending a little bit over an hour with me. And when I go through and uh, when I go through and do the editing, this will any dead spaces that are in there will get cut out. So it may, you know, it'll where we had a pause here or there, that pause will disappear. So this interview uh, session may may get cut back as much as 15 minutes out of it just to cut the dead air out. So let me say, I, I just appreciate make it, it all it can be. And Doug typed up that he, that the, his much better half hates his 45, 1911, but loves her P two thirty eight. And that I can understand that my, I have a family member that I will not let near my two thirty eight because it might get confiscated. And, uh, <laughs> When they when they're back in the area, they don't get to go near my nine thirty eight either. Uh, but hey, guys, uh, I appreciate it. I appreciate your participation. And anytime I can do something to help you out, let me know. You want to come back on? Let let me know. And uh, if you guys are interested in doing a podcast yourselves, let me know uh, because I can help you do it. Or you want a guest host or guest co host on this one? I appreciate your efforts, and I, the mic's always open to you too. And Doug typed in, she has the rainbow 238 to ensure that he won't take it. (laughs) (laughs) Nice one. Nice catch. (laughs) If you want to contact the podcast, please send email to Aaron at gunrightsintexas.com. Or you can leave a comment on the webpage, which is gunrightsintexas.com. However, if you want to leave a voicemail and be featured on the show, then please do so by dialing 409-292-6736. All righty then. We are now at the new segment of the show. But before I start doing that, let me just say that segment was pre-recorded and that is possibly one of the best roundtables a show could do if you're trying to get people involved in politics simply because the people that are speaking are the ones that are going to go out and vote. Now, I do want to say that everybody I got on that round table was a member of the Texas CHL forum. And I want to, I really want to say that if you're interested in gun rights or you're interested in the concealed handgun license, go to the Texas CHL forum websites, Texas CHL forum.com go there, join it, or at least lurk. Read through all the posts. You don't have to join. Just read through the posts, and you'll find something that interests you. It's a good forum. It's highly involved in the politics, and a lot of good material is there. All you got to do is go look for it. Now then, let's go to the news segment, which, oddly enough, let me point out in full disclosure, I have been communicating, blah, got my tongue tied there. I have been communicating with Mike from Come and Take It, the podcast, Not not the gun group, but the podcast. And he shared a link with me. I hadn't seen it come across my feeds, but then again, uh, my sinuses and all the stuff I've been doing for the last two days have pretty much kept me from actually checking my feeds. Well, he sent me a link to an article with the Huffington Post that has the headline, Rick Perry, not a big fan of openly carrying guns. Essentially, the article says the former governor said he was skeptical of open carry gun laws. And while the article Uh, says that it also points out that the current governor believes there is a high probability that open carry will pass in some form during this session. There'll be a link to the article in the show notes as usual. And I got one other news story. 
It's an issue that we touched on in the round table. You see, Corey Watkins opened his mouth again and more damage or more damage damage that applies to. However, more damage uh, to open carry came out. Many say that Corey was actually making terroristic threats, and that's the camp that I tend to lean towards. Others say he was just making an emotional plea. Mm. I'm not too keen on that one. Now, I would like to point out that myself and others have noted that he appears to not be in his right mind while he was making the video, possibly due to narcotics usage. Look at his eyes. That's all I can say. With that said, I want to wrap the show up. And after the show, I'll give you a little bit of news about how this particular episode was produced. Thank you for listening to the Gun Rights in Texas podcast. Please leave a review on iTunes or send feedback to the host. Your input will be used to improve the show. Stay safe and please carry responsibly. This episode of the Gun Rights in Texas podcast was produced using a new recording device. The audio from the roundtable, the audio uh, that isn't from the roundtable, all of it was recorded on a Zoom H6. This gives me the ability to record four channels and play with audio levels in, on each individual uh, channel. And because I am recording four channels, I can put myself on one channel, the music on another, the roundtable on another, and if I have another guest, I can put them on yet another channel. All this gets recorded on independent channels where, say, one person says a word that's not quite acceptable while everybody else is talking. Rather than mute the whole conversation, I can go back and mute that one person's word. How cool is that? The device is a little on the expensive side, but I think in the end it'll give me a much better product, so it's worth it. With that said, please stay safe and carry responsibly.